Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features Chris Scarabedian, founder of Zontogeny, which is partnered with Perceptive Advisors to support multiple promising technologies from early development through clinical proof concept. Then Jennifer, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our New York Bio uh, weekly virtual breakfast series. Chris Garabedian is our guest today. Um, and we wanted to kick things off today with a little bit of news. Every week we give you some New York Bio news. Um, today, those of you who are on our distribution list should have received an email from me a little before seven um, that I wasn't writing a little before seven, but <laughs> it should have hit your inboxes. The big news in New York over the last 24 hours is that Governor Cuomo yesterday issued some more guidance around what he had already previewed as a four-phase reopening of New York's economy, um, dividing the state into 10 regions and requiring a certain set of criteria that each region must meet independently in order to then advance to the phase reopening. Um, and it looks like now of the 10 regions, three are ready to open starting Friday. Um, that would be the Finger Lakes, the Mohawk Valley, and the Southern Tier. So clearly some of the more rural areas of the state. Um, New York City, I think is five out of seven of the criteria. Um, and the email I sent has all the information and links to all of the governor's uh, directives in it. Um, but if anyone has any questions or needs any more information, um, we're happy to provide it. I think the, the takeaway for, for life sciences companies is and many of you um, have already been uh, continuing to work in your labs, continuing to do experiments because the R&D work has been deemed essential. Um, and so this guidance should help you identify and develop plans for bringing your office staff back into the office, the people who were working remotely. Um, there's a ways to go, frankly, for downstate, um, but I think we'll get there. And then one other piece along those same lines, clearly you can't have a conversation around uh, coronavirus and what's happening in the states without talking about what's happening at the federal level and what legislation has been passed. And so next Monday at 1 p.m., we'll be hosting a similar format roundtable call uh, with Congressman Joe Morelli. So he'll be our guest and talk to us about things that are they're planning in Washington as everyone, I think, if you read the papers, you know, um, the House is working on whether you call it a CARES point 4.0, 3.0, however you delineate the number of relief bills that have been, um, been issued and passed so far. Um, so that said, today's format, let me do my little spiel. Um, at the bottom of your screen, if you hover over it, there's a chat and a Q&A uh, feature. Please use that to ask questions of Chris. Uh, we'll help moderate those questions that come in throughout our discussion. We want it to be interactive, and we think that that provides the most uh, value for everyone, including Chris, and we're thrilled to have him with us. I'm going to kick it over to Derek to do a more formal introduction, and then we'll just get going. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, Chris, thank you so much for being with us. This is exciting. Uh, you know, anytime we get the opportunity to, you know, talk to people that uh, are kind of pushing things forward from an entrepreneurial perspective and, and breaking new barriers. I think this is really a, a great opportunity for us and really a great opportunity for our audience. Um, we like to kind of give uh, you a little bit of an opportunity to kind of tell people where you came from uh, and uh, what you're doing now. And then we, we will get uh, deeper into the conversation. Great. And I apologize in the morning hours, I get a lot of emails and texts. So I just tried to turn that off. So I hope I, no, no noise will distract us. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I uh, so Chris Garabedian, uh, I run an accelerator in Boston called Zontogeny uh, and a, a venture fund for perceptive advisors, the Perceptive Zontogeny Venture Fund. But that comes with about 28 years of uh, experience. I started my career in consulting. I went to Abbott Pharmaceuticals, now AbbVie in the mid 90s, uh, did some uh, kind of uh, uh, brand management, new product development. Uh, and then I joined Gilead in the mid-90s, 1997, was there about eight years in both operational roles and corporate development roles. So that's kind of where I cut my teeth in biotech uh, during those kind of growth years, launching products globally and uh, really uh, helping plan, do some business development M&A there. And then I uh, was at Celgene as head of corporate strategy, was there about four years. Um, and uh, uh, I left there uh, to take the job to 
be the CEO of AVI, which was a 30 year old company that I renamed Sarepta, moved it to Boston, Cambridge, uh, and uh, you know really led the DMD strategy for the first uh, product approval in, in the US. Uh, so that's a, a br brief sketch of my background, uh, but have worked a lot in uh, evaluating both internal programs uh, that are either preclinical or early development stage programs, or uh, looking at business development acquisitions that were preclinical or early stage clinical. So it's a lot of what I'm doing now. I've had that experience uh, uh, in the past. That's really great. Thank you. So one of the things that I thought would be interesting to start with is, you know, I think a lot of people know a little bit about the story of Sarepta, but, you know, really what rarely gets taken into account is, you know, what it looked like before you got there uh, and, and why, why you really left to go there. What was the thing about it that you, that you thought was a great opportunity. So you have this company that's, you know, you said 30 years old at the time, and you know, you're, you're the head of corporate strategy for Celgene. You know, what are the circumstances that, that lead you to say, I, I wanna go do this. I wanna go do something different in an obviously different risk category and obviously different product category, et cetera. Yeah, well, you know, throughout my career, I, I've never really shied away from the challenges. In fact, oftentimes I was, uh, kind of given the challenging areas for the companies I worked for to try to figure it out. And so I originally joined the board of AVI to get some public company board experience to try to figure out if I could take all that experience and guide a company that had struggled uh, and how to shape that strategy. And uh, shortly after that, it was clear that the experience from Gilead and Celgene could really be applied. And frankly, I said no to the consideration as CEO, probably about a a half a dozen times before uh, some key investors really pushed me hard to consider it. And I really looked at the technology. I did my research, read the literature on why their technology was differentiated. And uh, I, I felt that it was, you know, clearly a huge challenge. I didn't know how big of a challenge until I got into the company and, and realized that, you know, I, I guess it's a realization that of the thousands of biotech companies out there, there aren't thousands of great management teams that have had the experience of getting a drug through development and to approval. And so, you know, coming from some of the best and brightest companies that the industry has seen and learning, you know, from the best and brightest, I mean, that's, you know, been, you know, what I'm most grateful for is having, you know, the colleagues that I had at Gilead and Celgene to learn how to do this. I felt that, you know, I knew what it would take to make this, you know, technology uh, get you know, uh, through, through to success. So uh, partly it was the challenge uh, and partly it was the opportunity to really shape, right, um, uh, what the company would look like moving forward. And, you know, and so we didn't have much cash. <laughs> I had to convince uh, investors that this was a new company. Uh, don't look at the last 30 years as a, you know, a harbinger for the future. And, uh, you know, slowly started to construct kind of the right, you know, uh, strategy, the right, you know, development program, you know, the company at the time was looking to partner off the DMD program. And I said, wait a minute, this is the most valuable thing you have. And, uh, you know, nobody knows how to develop this. So why do we think that partnering to a large pharma company is going to do a better job? And so it started with that. And then, you know, slowly built out, you know, a management team, uh, and, you know, really, uh, was able to raise more money. The, the real, um, inflection point was when we had that small 12 patient study that's all we could afford to do at the time when the 48 week data ran, ran out we went from about a 70 million dollar uh, market value to a billion within less than three months on some very encouraging you know albeit small uh, trial data and that's when I was able to raise money build out manufacturing you know kind of uh, kind of grow up if you will to be a biotech that wasn't cash poor anymore and wasn't mm -hmm. constrained. And so, so it's kind of, um, you know, it was really, uh, I think the opportunity to really own it and shape it uh, and, uh, and use all the experience from Gilead and Celgene uh, that I had to, to do it the right way. Yeah. Were there any, you know, if you, if you look back now, before you get to, before you get to everything with the FDA, what are, what are some of the things that were either bigger challenges than you thought they were going to be or, or, or what kind of came out of left field that you weren't ready for? Yeah, you know, I think it was a situation where, and this is probably true with a lot of cash strap companies. Uh, and by the way, today, 
you know, if you go back 10 years or 15 years, you know, you could count on two hands the number of companies that had successfully remained independent with a commercial right. product that were profitable, right? And now we have more, which is good. You know, more people have had the experience of being successful in biotech. So we're in much better shape now in terms of experience management. Um, uh, so, you know, when you start going, you know, this, that was a company that was founded in 1980, <laughs> you know, and nobody knew what they were doing, you know, back then. And, and so, you know, I think from a development standpoint, there were good researchers, of course. And so, you know, from, from that vantage point, I think, you know, going into the company and realizing like, wow, they really didn't have best practices. They didn't have the documentation. They didn't understand how to apply quality to the work they were doing. They didn't understand what the FDA's expectations were, you know, from the data sets. So one of the rules that uh, I had to adopt quickly was, look, we can't go back and fix what wasn't done right and correctly. But what we can do is from here on, we can do it the right way. And the FDA generally has looked at intent, right? Well, we understand what you were inheriting, but what are you doing now? And are you trying to do it the right way? And we'll be flexible. And so that was kind of the, 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 the rule that I put in place is like, we need to start doing it the right way now. But you know, when I looked back at the history of data, and by the way, it was great technology, and there were really, uh, really top tier researchers there who you know loved this technology and they did a lot of experiments it just wasn't always done in the best way the right design you know the, the types of trials and experiments that are beyond reproach where everybody you know uh, uh you know doesn't question or doubt the results and you know there wasn't great documentation and so some sometimes we had data sets that weren't even published so it was really applying best practices so we could turn the company into something that were was held in high esteem Often the working hard, but not working smart. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, something tells me we're going to come back to that point in, uh, in, <laughs> in a little while, too. Um, so I think one of the interesting things here, you know, if you think about parallels to, to COVID, right, you know, you have you have something now that is that is kind of come out of left field and really kind of thrown everyone for a loop, although quite honestly, you were in a, a albeit more isolated situation where you know, you were kind of treading on, you know, ground that nobody had ever gone down before. Um, and I wondered if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what it was like to really lead the team in those times. And what are some of the things that either uh, that you did and you, you look back now that you either think you did well or you look back and say you, you wish you could have done a little bit better. But I mean, I think now there's a lot of people who are either trying to rescue a clinical trial or who find themselves in, a very difficult situation from a management standpoint. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there's probably a lot of parallels with, with what you went through with, uh, with the development style. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think um, it was probably, I mean, it, it almost felt like, you know, for the first two years, <laughs> it was crisis mode and it was, you know, survival. It was trying to figure out, you know, uh, you know, just you know, really working hard with a, with a small team to, to make something happen. But it's interesting you bring the COVID because we actually had advanced development projects mm -hmm. with the Department of Defense. Uh, we had done rapid response exercises to figure out how quickly could we develop a drug for a new virus that emerged. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, an Ebola program, a Marburg hemorrhagic fever program, a pandemic flu program. And so I was on the front lines working with development stage, you know, government. But, you know, that was in anticipation of either you know, a bioweapon or a, you know, pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, you know, the government was trying to prepare for these, but budget crunches ended up closing programs that was never fully funded the way it should. Um, but what's interesting is that when you go to Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, when you engage the patient community and you realize the urgency of this, you know, I, 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 I uh, had a phrase that I like to kind of keep as a guidepost, which is, you know, uh, impatience is a virtue, right? And the idea yep. is that when you're not working for yourself, right, that's when patience is a virtue. When you're working for somebody else, right, to help them, you know, impatience is a virtue. And it was like, we wanted to do everything we could to help these families that I would meet with. And, you know, they were racing the clock. And so that was what guided me to do everything I could to try to give a solution, right, to the Duchenne. And so, um, so that urgency I felt for Duchenne. Now, ironically, when Ebola came in 2014, and I was on the 
probably the news more for our Ebola drug mm -hmm. that we had stockpiled uh, a small amount and we were offering that up. I was criticized, why are you focusing on this Ebola thing, right? You know, it's like, you know, you have a Duchenne program, you know, you know, shame on you for going out and trying to help the world against Ebola. And so, you know, I, I definitely, uh, but it was that same sense of urgency. If we can do something to help, we wanted to do it. However, there is a lesson there, which is all of these companies, and we've seen it in the early stage uh, biotechs, trying to pivot, how can we help COVID? Well, again, I, I'm, humbled by the amazing overwhelming response from the industry to COVID. And we have, you know, dozens, maybe over a hundred, you know, programs that have been identified, uh, treatment and vaccines. And so I, I love that response. But as a biotech, you have to remember, why are you here? Where was your technology originally developed for? You know, what's the best application for it to work? Mm -hmm. And to really be thoughtful about is COVID the best application of this? Do we want to divert attention and resources away from it? And I think maybe the answer is yes in the case where they really have a viable, you know, treatment for it. But I think that there's a lot of opportunism that rears its head, you know, in situations like this to either boost the stock or, you know, try to get, you know, people more interested in it or, you know, uh, you know, we've heard the term smart money and I'll say less sophisticated money that will chase, oh, you have a COVID treatment, let me give you money for that. So I think, you know, we see all sides of this, the, you know, um, you know, the, 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 the good, bad and the ugly. So I, I think it was really a neat experience that I had, uh, you know, both on a uh, urgent situation working with the government and trying to urgently push forward a, a treatment for a terminal, you know, rare disease. You know, we're seeing right now a similar, a similar situation in because obviously a lot of our biotech companies are working on rare disease and in the rare disease space as well. And patient foundations are very anxious about the diversion of resources and the lack of continued pushing forward, right, on the, the issues that affect their, um, their patients. So there's that. And then also, but I also think that's compounded or maybe it's a positive because patient foundations have become increasingly important in the drug development process and working with uh, the R&D and pharma companies, as well as even being possibly, you know, in some cases, they're the IND sponsor. Um, so yeah, so talk to us a little bit. And we actually had a question about um, the value of working with patients and families that brought to the DMD program. So talk to our audience a little bit more about working with patient foundations, because clearly we have a lot of them in New York. So there's a lot of interest around that. Yeah and how yeah. that you saw it play out at Sarepta work with your development program. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was in uh, at Gilead in the mid 90s and the real uh, original mm -hmm. patient advocates, right, yeah. were HIV, right, yeah. and uh, uh, patient advocacy. And so, you know, I, I really, uh, again, was, was lucky having to engage and work with these patient groups, you know, and advocacy organizations that, you know, ran the gamut from, you know, we want to be side by side with pharma and those that were like, pharma is the evil enemy, right? You know, yeah. stopping us from getting treatments yeah. or charging too much. And so I, I really kind of grew up in the industry with mm -hmm. really being fine tuned to listen and understand the patient, you know, voice and their involvement, even when we got into pricing and all of that right. uh, uh, would be very involved. And so then I was at Celgene and, uh, you know, uh, some of you may know Kathy Giusti, uh, who started the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, you know, there were no my multiple myeloma treatments when she started. And now there's, you know, more than a dozen. And uh, it was really her will and interest in, and she, you know, she knew she was a, you know, a Harvard MBA. She understood what it took to, you know, invest in and get drugs developed. And so she realized that it was through a partnership there, you know, uh, that we needed. And there are others, you know, the CF Foundation, Bob Deal, uh, you know, you've got, you know, uh, Michael J. Fox, and you've got others that have really uh, early on embraced the idea that we need to find treatments that actually treat patients, right? And not just, you know, this amorphous will support research in the area and the hope for a cure, you know, that was the old way. And then people got more pragmatic. And so, so when it came time to take over Sarepta, you know, rare disease, uh, you know, you, you had, you know, ALS and some that were you know, people were appreciated, but, you know, it's funny, the first, uh, 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 the real first fundraiser, right, 
or focus on rare disease was probably Jerry Lewis Telethon, right? Going yeah. back, you know, 50 plus years was, yeah. hey, we need to help those with muscular dystrophy. Yeah. And by the way, the uh, Duchenne mm -hmm. was often, you know, uh, one of the ones that was most, you know, severe and terminal and, and visible where you saw these young, you know, uh, mostly, you know, uh, boys that affected mostly boys in these wheelchairs, uh, you know, at a young age. And so I, I think that um, there was already the landscape there. And what, when I in, came on board uh, uh, to take on the Duchenne program at, at Sarepta, uh, uh, there were already dozens around the globe that were going after muscular dystrophy. Many of them were focused on Duchenne, specifically PPMD, uh, Cure Duchenne, uh, you know, MDA was still around. And so I would say the, the learnings from that is, while we were, um, I think we were unique, or I think we had the, the garnered a lot of the attention because, you know, we were at this nexus of the legislature in the U.S. Mm -hmm. urging the FDA to think about accelerated approval for rare disease. And, you know, uh, PDUFA 5 that was passed in the middle of 2012, we were the first company, uh, you yeah. know, after that to, to bring a program. And back then it was controversial. And it was also controversial because it was a small data set and it was, you know, not, you know, a curative uh, data set. But I think, uh, you know, we were the first to kind of broach that subject with the FDA. And I think today, as you fast forward, you know, almost 10 years later, uh, you know, you really can't uh, operate without engaging all the advocates and the patient groups and making them a partner in that. And, you know, the FDA opened their doors to more patient advocacy. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of great learnings there. I wouldn't trade it for anything uh, to be on, you know, the front lines of that working with the patient advocacy groups, you know, uh, sitting in FDA meetings. I, you know, probably, you know, had a dozen interactions with the FDA over the, you know, two and a half, three years that we were trying to get a Templarson approved. So, you know, there were a lot of, uh, you know, uh, learnings through that process that, that, you know, have really, help me understand both patient advocacy and the FDA in that context. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. So we, I think you, so as, as you go, uh, so you, 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 you get the, the product approved, the product is, is now on the market and, you know, you now, you now find yourself as the, uh, as the head of uh, Zontogeny, right? So, it, so how did it, how did you go from, you know, how did you go from the, the challenge of Sarepta, if you will, to, you know, then, you know, thinking about early stage biotech investing. I mean, it, you know, really, yeah. on, you know, was it not risky enough that you, that you had to do the first, yeah. the first thing with this, this that you never, uh, that, that no one ever had a cure for anymore? You yeah. had to go and do something that was just as difficult, if not more so. Well, yeah, well, it's a great question. I mean, first, just to clarify. So uh, I left in 2015. The issues and back and forth with the FDA didn't stop after I left. Ed K took yeah. over. It took another uh, couple of years to get the product approved. So, and we're all happy, but, you know, uh, we were all part of being an architect of that program and the strategy with the FDA. And so we're, we're all pleased that that drug got approved. But when I left Sarepta, I really had to think about looking back on a long career in biotech and how can I best apply all of these learnings, right? Having worked at Gilead, uh, worked at Celgene, been a public company CEO, uh, what's the best way to utilize that? And of course, a lot of uh, people in my position would have just taken the next promising CEO job of a early stage biotech. And I felt that I could do more. What I loved the most was doing good drug development, right? Yes, I could do the attending the investment conferences and presenting and doing the interviews with the media. And, you know, but there was a lot of things that were not about building companies. It was about preparing for the next board meeting, you know, reviewing 10 Ks and 10 Qs, right. You know, and, yeah. and uh, you know, managing a large staff and there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, of the, the, the people management and all of that. And it was, and I really enjoyed the art and process of drug development. And so as I thought about this, it wasn't something that, you know, um, came to me initially, it was after the, the first nine months after I left Sarepta, I counted no less than 70 uh, reach outs uh, from entrepreneurs, scientific founders who wanted to start a company or just started a company, were trying to license a, a product or what have you. And they were usually first time CEOs. They recognized they didn't have decades of industry experience. And, you know, and the nice thing about Sarepta, it definitely uh, made me a known entity, but I also had a great network going back to Celgene and Gilead and 
was involved in a lot of other extracurricular industry things. So uh, I just had people referring people to me and you know reach outs uh, through LinkedIn and others. And I started realizing there's a huge gap here, right? Nobody is making their primary business model to work with and embrace the entrepreneur, right? And the, and the first time CEO. And they were, you know, many of them were longing for mentorship and guidance and they wanted a partnership and they wanted to be CEO, <laughs> at least initially, right? And, and I didn't need to be CEO of all these companies, but I liked the idea of uh, working with what I thought were the best technologies and I knew that just collecting, you know, because originally they just wanted me to assume a board seat, a senior advisor role, give me some free equity and help them and, you know, put them on their pitch deck slide to show they have a credible, you know, group around them. And I said, you know, what I've learned, if I've learned anything over the last, you know, 20 plus years of the industry, that's not the way to do, you know, uh, good, uh, successful drug development. You need to be actively involved. Sometimes key decisions are made every week, right? And so I said, the only way to do this right is to not just, you know, check the box uh, on a board meeting every quarter and learn about the mistakes they made, you know, and try to fix them, but to actually be very involved. And I, the, the inflection point came where I said, you know, I can't do this myself and I can't, you know, start writing seed checks out of my own pocket. And I got to know easily the top 50 public equity investors out there in, in life sciences. And I put at the top of my list, perceptive advisors. I mean, they did great diligence. They were, you know, they weren't jerks. They were really uh, thoughtful people that, you know, respected the position they had in, in the industry. And so I came to them and I realized they hadn't really done much early private mm -hmm. investment. They had gotten into the crossover arena. So they were big public equity investor. They had really become on the short list of crossovers uh, to help companies go public, but you could count on, you know, one hand, the number of, you know, seed series A investments they've done. And they weren't really uh, interested in building out a big venture arm, you know, like an NEA or a Deerfield, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. I brought them this idea of an accelerator and they invested uh, in Zontogeny in 2017 so that I could build out a team uh, and write seed checks. I have a uh, we have a full-time staff of seven. I have two entrepreneurs and residents. We have about a dozen uh, consultants that we work with that we don't need to bring on full-time at this point. And, uh, you know, we've had no problem sourcing. We've had, you know, uh, we just had an analysis yesterday. We had over 700 opportunities we've looked at in the last couple of years. Uh, we say no, unfortunately, to a large majority of those, but we do try to give good feedback. And uh, in our diligence process, we try to coach and advise the entrepreneurs we engage. Uh, to try to, you know, tell them what they need to do. And if they get some funding, how they should deploy that. And those that we do like, they quickly realize that, hey, we're drug developers at heart, and we're going to do everything we can to increase the likelihood of success. When we are in an industry where 90 plus percent of things fail, they recognize that they might have a better chance of it working if they partner with those of us who've been in the industry, you know, for, for decades. Yeah. That's good. So to keep going on that, uh, one of the audience asked, asked a good question. You know, what are some of the things that you look for in you know, a CEO and, and a management team at a small startup company? And I think we can probably split this question into two. So what are, what are some of the characteristics that you think really kind of prime that company for success? And secondarily, what are some of the characteristics that you think kind of fit best with Zontogeny, right? So there's a lot of, like you said, there's, there's so many different flavors of, of entrepreneurs that you can work with you know, where are the places that you think Zontogeny kind of helps the most and that you guys can best apply your team skills to make sure that you get to, you know, more value and build the company out? Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is that our model is very conducive to supporting a less experienced team or CEO. Uh, you go to many VCs, uh, that's what they'll say. We, all we, you know, focus on is the team and the, you know, how experienced and credible. Well, that's what we're supposed to bring to the table so that they don't have to. But they also, uh, you know, uh, need to have that humility. I'm all in favor of, you know, young entrepreneurs who are smart and passionate and know uh, uh, their technology, but they also have to realize what they don't know, which is, you know, that comes with experience, the living with the failures and successes, you know, uh, you know, through drug development and having been exposed to many different technologies along the way and, you know, uh, learning from, you know, those experiments. And so 
I think we want someone who is passionate, who is, uh, brings an intelligence and an understanding of their technology, but who's also open and flexible and realizes they need help, right? Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, there's a self-selection process. The large majority of uh, uh, things we look at are those self, you know, seeking us and they know they want help and need help. You know, we're not trying to go into an academic center and you know, telling a scientist, you know, you don't know what you're doing and you need us, you know, and, and let, let us come in and take some equity and, and take your technology and move it forward. They have to get to the point. And sometimes they, they try and fail to do it themselves and then they get humbled that way, right? But I think um, we're more interested in the collaborative spirit, the appreciation that being a good researcher and doing great work in the lab and applying the scientific method and, uh, is one skill and that's a very distinct and different skill than being a good drug developer, right? Mm -hmm. Which is around, you know, everything from how do you construct a design for answering the right questions and not too many questions. And, you know, how do you do it where you test the right range of doses or, you know, you have, you need to test more than one formulation or uh, a lead uh, or, you know, what is the right positive control you should use? And is this a, a model that others have used and is referenceable in the literature? Or if there is a better model, how do we interpret that data in a vacuum if nobody else is using that proprietary model? So th that's just an example of preclinical, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, where there's regulatory strategy that comes with that. It's the right phase one, phase two strategy. Do you do long-term animal talks so you can go into a longer experience study in patients out of the gate, right? You know, so these are some of the things in drug development that we think about and uh, usually that doesn't come from working in the lab for you know, 15, 20 years. And so uh, that's where we like to feel that there's a synergy uh, and an understanding that we both need each other. And frankly, where this came from, I'm not a scientist uh, by training, and, but I had to find a way to work with researchers credibly throughout my career, right? Mm -hmm. you know, going back to Gilead, you, know, you couldn't get very far at Gilead if you didn't understand the science and could mm -hmm. have intelligent, uh, engaging debate and conversations with the scientists, right? You never claim to know more than they did, but it's all in the art of the questions you ask, right? Yeah. Have we ever thought about this approach? Do we, why, why wouldn't this work? And then oftentimes you're like, well, I've never thought of that. Or, you know, maybe it will, maybe we should do experiment. So I think, um, you know, kind of going back to the Socratic method of, you know, asking good questions can reveal much, you know, um, that's what you guys do, right? You ask good questions to uh, get people to talk and, and have insightful things to say. Yeah. My, yeah. Um, my law professor that... thought we asked questions too. <laughs> um, we did have <laughs> yeah. a threshold a question about entrepreneurs. Um, and this question is, um, what, who do you see as an entrepreneur? Must an entrepreneur have an academic or a pharmacy legacy or a pharma legacy in order to be considered? Like who comes in your door and you view them as a credible entrepreneur that you want to engage with? You know, I, uh, while we appreciate and respect people's training and background, okay, um, you know, it, it, we, we really try to ignore that when assessing somebody. So it really is, I mean, I, we, we are incubating a company right now uh, and evaluating several uh, antifibrotic uh, products uh, uh, that you know, could, could go into uh, some pulmonary function. And we've even thought about some COVID applications along the way. Uh, the entrepreneur there is a kind of strategic uh, marketing business guy, right? And yet we rely on him for diligence. I mean, he, is one of the best competitive intelligence people I know of looking at the landscape and understanding different approaches. And, and so, you know, I don't look at it and say, well, gee, you don't have your, you know, PhD and you're not really qualified to do this. We, we try to, and by the way, I've been the beneficiary of that, right? Uh, and have my career, right, has been uh, based on what I contribute and, and, you know, do I have smart things to, to say and, and, and add value to. Uh, and I think it's almost like, you know, uh, once people realize that it doesn't matter what school you went to or what your major was when you're in the workforce, it's like, what are you doing today? And how are you contributing? And also it, it comes with, you know, again, thoughtfulness, always learning, right? You know, never feeling like, oh, I figured it all out. I mean, you know, it, there's a, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, understanding what you don't know is often the key. And also we, we look at ethics, right? You know, uh, if people are focused on, 
we can make a lot of money. I think this, you know, if we do this the right way, if, if, if we hear somebody that all they're thinking about is look at that company that just got sold for a billion dollars. And I think we could position this and make a lot of money. Well, wait, let, let's figure out how to do the, to develop the technology first. And then, you know, think good things will come. And so, you know, we kind of often, um, and we, we try to have a detector of, are they just giving lip service to that, you know, uh, of not caring about the money. And so, you know, I think it's a combination of, you know, you know, humility, uh, being open-minded and flexible, contributing and having a strong work ethic and bringing an intelligence to it. Um, but, you know, intelligence and wisdom are two different things. And I think we feel like, you know, bringing intelligent people together and sharing our experiences and helping shape that produces this wisdom of how to do drug development the right way. And let me tell you, if every if people thought they knew it all before, two months at home, everyone working and schooling under the same roof makes us all a little humble. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the byproduct of uh, COVID for sure. Yep. No, it's you you definitely you definitely are working different muscles in this uh, in this new exercise that we've been going through for the last uh, for the last little while. So I think it'd be really interesting to transition a little bit to kind of some of your early impressions of, of New York, right? Because, you know, it's, it's been, it's been lovely, right? So I, as somebody who's been in New York for 14 years now, and has spent a lot of time within the entrepreneurial community, you know, I've seen this progression from, you know, where New York was to now where we think it's going, right? And, and the, the leaps have been amazing. And one of the big things was, you know, the New York didn't always have uh, a very active crop of early stage investors that really were focusing on kind of turning over the rocks and, and really looking in, in our own backyards for interesting technologies. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice when someone like you has, has come in and really started to do uh, a lot of that work. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you were thinking about uh, New York when you first yeah. thought of it, you know, and what it's been like trying to get things off the ground here. Yeah, look, first, uh, let me say in full disclosure, I'm on the board of MassBio. I love Massachusetts. We love our workforce. Having said that, my business model works with, you know, cities across the country, even outside of the U.S. And we, we, we like to think we have a remote, uh, friendly business model where we don't, you don't have to have your company headquartered in Boston for us to work with you. And I have to say, New York, uh, I think, has all of the ingredients, right, to become one of the next big breakout uh, biotechs. And I really have seen uh, that transformation occur over the last, you know, 10 years and the will to make it succeed. And, and one thing I'll say, and why I think New York uh, has, I would also say this about very uh, densely populated, right, metropolises that can attract a workforce. You need a broad-based workforce uh, to be successful. So, you know, if you think beyond New York, you know, I think the Chicago's and Phillies and DC's and Houston's have an opportunity also, and it comes with that strategy and that will to make it happen. But, but why New York is special is the density of institutions, the mm -hmm. amount of funding, grant funding and NIH funding that comes in. You mentioned the patient advocacy and, you know, dollars that come in non-dilutively uh, uh, for uh, advancing programs. You have a workforce. I mean, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, the, the front yard of the pharma corridor, right? Uh, right. Uh, if you will. And you've got, you know, you know, Re Regeneron, you've got, you know, legacy companies that have, you know, been acquired like Mclone. You know, you have obviously Pfizer headquarters there uh, and you have Celgene, you know, right over uh, uh, across the river there. So I think from a, a workforce, you have it, you have enough experience of breakout biotechs and pharma companies that have been there, done that, and know how to do it successfully. And so I think the combination of research institutions, which by the way, also those are clinical trial sites and being able to drive yep. clinical trials um, and a area that people are generally attracted to move to, right, for jobs and don't feel like if this biotech that they join doesn't work out, that they don't have other opportunities. And frankly, that's harder if you're going to Boise, Idaho, right? <laughs> and want to live there and work in, in biotech, or I don't mean to pick on Boise, but that could be anywhere, you know, uh, in the flyover states. So, mm -hmm. so I think that, you know, uh, and by the way, I just, uh, you know, I'll tell you, one of our first companies that we seed funded 
and uh, is part of the Zontogeny uh, family is uh, BioHarmony. We uh, uh, found a really uh, rock star emerging uh, 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 first time CEO in Chandra Ghost, uh, who's based in New York. She had identified some uh, technology at a Rockefeller University in the antibacterial space. And again, we got involved and helped with licensing that on the right terms so that it was investable, helped you know, pay for some of the patent costs uh, early on. Uh, you know, we were able to uh, support some of the early experiments. We uh, helped support and led a deal with Beringer Ingelheim that's been announced where they took on the recombinant, you know, a systemic approach to the, using this technology. And so that's the type of value we bring. And yes, we take some early equity, but you don't have to raise money to just pay a big management team, right, to help you do all that. That's what we're right. doing, right? And then we, be, we put ourselves in the same boat as an entrepreneur where we don't want to get diluted in the next round either. And we want to argue for the best value and we want to deploy that early capital as wisely as possible, right? To uh, create a value inflection. So, you know, we have found uh, that, um, you know, New York, and by the way, you know, uh, you know, uh, Chandra is very connected to the network, has introduced me to other entrepreneurs, has been a, a great voice piece for saying, you know, uh, how great a model like this is. And credit to Rockefeller University for saying, hey, we want to see more biotechs. We don't just want to license to, you know, pharma or big biotech, right, or emerging biotech. We like the idea that you're prioritizing our program as the, you know, raison d'etre for your biotech company, and you've surrounded yourself with good people who know what they're doing, you know, first-time entrepreneur. And so, you know, Rockefeller University also saw uh, the, the opportunity to support you know biotechs that are you know emerging and also first time CEOs where they didn't require that you know Chris Garabedian didn't have to be the CEO for them to to license the the product. Yep. Well, we you know we know Chandra very well since we were around her in, in Launch Labs all the time. She's she's brilliant and and she's fantastic. Um, you know, one of the interesting things too is if you think about the area they're in in infectious disease. Um, you know, it's a it's a difficult area to invest in. Do you find that, you know, do you find that you shy away from areas like that, or are you really kind of more led by the the people and the technology for what you think they can do? Because I think as 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 this has shown us, you know, things things change, right? So you know, Veer is yeah. looking like a pretty prescient uh, startup idea now that they're they're yeah. fully ensconced in in antiviral treatments. So. Yeah, and, and you could say Moderna and their pivot, right, to vaccines was also prescient. Um, so, you know, look, I think in general, okay, and this is true with, you know, uh, Perceptive and the venture fund I run for Perceptive Advisors, we, we look first at the technology and we look at how can that technology, is it likely to work <laughs> if we do good drug development and what's the best application for that technology in the clinic to, to not only, uh, what's the most likely to work, but also uh, if it's likely to work in several areas, what's the most, you know, um, uh, greatest unmet need, right, to apply this to create value, right, uh, for the dollars that we invest. Um, the, but the, the, the other thing we look at after all of that, right, is, okay, we, I have to answer to my investors, right? And that's true with any biotech, any VC, right? We have investors who want, expect us to make money for them. And one of the questions that always comes up is exit, right? Okay, you know, and we, we like to think about that last. What's our exit strategy? If we do good drug development, then it'll be a valuable asset and someone will, mm -hmm. you know, find a way to either take an IPO or, or, or acquire it. And those are generally the two ways of exits. You, is it an IPO-able program or is this going to get to a point where uh, pharma or biotech will step up and acquire it, right? So when you think about exits, this is where there are certain areas that pharma has largely moved away from. And you've seen them rationalize the therapeutic areas that they're interested in, right? And you know, this is not just true of you know, uh, infectious disease antibiotics. Uh, it's true of other areas, right? You know, some have gotten out of cardiovascular, some have moved yep. out of CNS, some have moved out of you know, uh, dermatology, right? You know, whatever. Uh, and so I think that is part of it is what value is there? You know, we know immuno-oncology, right? You know, it, it, it's kind of like, if you have that in your name and you're in the clinic, you know, you might have a half a billion dollar valuation just alone <laughs> on the promise. Uh, that, that's not true with an antibiotic, right? As an example, 
And so we know that there are fewer natural acquirers and we know mm -hmm. that those who have gone public don't have huge valuations with the exceptions you, you've named, Vera as an example. Uh, yep. and, and so I think those are the things that uh, we try to find what are the right pathways? Who are the right investors that you know, are contrarian and say, I know this will swing back or I know there will be new applications, right? You know, secondary infections to you know, viral pneumonia is one of those things that people are saying, hey, maybe we need to prepare for, you know, uh, finding newer and better antibiotics, right? Because, you know, everybody uh, who had COVID and had pneumonia was likely given, you know, Zithromax or antibiotic, right? Yeah. To prevent yeah. secondary infection. So I think that uh, it will open up opportunities, I hope. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, we're even for BioHarmony, we're thinking about those pulmonary uh, applications that could be uh, beneficial. Yeah, I mean, if you even just look at uh, remdesivir as as a case here, right? It's it's you know it's not a silver bullet, but with any sort of emergent disease like this, we're looking for any way that we can provide kind of some value to patients. Can you get them out of the hospital earlier? Can you prevent complications? I think if if nothing else, I think we have a, I hope that we emerge from this with a real appreciation for the progression of disease. Uh, for really kind of the costs and the challenges that come with, you know, kind of an, an overburdened uh, hospital infrastructure, right? You know, sending, sending people into the ICU, putting people on a ventilator, all of these things are things that carry a very high uh, morbidity and mortality cost for patients, and they carry a very high cost for the hospital. And, you know, for, for nothing else, as we've seen, these are things that are not exactly kind of profit centers for the hospital either. If all a hospital can do is put people on ventilators in the ICU that is not good for the hospital's business. So hopefully this makes us a little bit smarter about, you know, how we think about treatment of disease and where we think about value in terms of, you know, what happens when a patient engages in the health in the healthcare system. So we had another question a little earlier that I, that I said I would get to in a few minutes about 25 minutes ago uh, about, you know, bringing more patients into the folds early and you know this is it's really a bit of a blue sky question is this something that you find yourself doing now in terms of thinking about either where where markets are going or where treatments are going or or even as early as you know the the development shaping the development program do you find yourself doing a lot of this or do you find some of the things that you're doing to be kind of too early on the spectrum for that to be very valuable yeah. Um, before I answer that question, you were highlighting the the, the need for other uh, healthcare interventions uh, due to COVID. Uh, I just wanted to highlight we are uh, looking at non-drug technologies as well and telemedicine and all these. I mean, I think we are very excited about new applications and you know, kind of uh, disruptive technologies, mm -hmm. uh, even non-drug. We mostly do drug uh, technologies, but I wanted to highlight that because you know, we welcome you know, entrepreneurs and, and those who are helping solve some of these things. Related to involving patients uh, earlier in the process, so I, you know, one of the things that I'm most grateful for from the Sarept experience are the relationships that I built uh, that have been longstanding with the patient community. Um, and they are also connected to other uh, disease foundations and other uh, patient advocates and families that are affected by other uh, diseases and conditions. And so from that vantage point, uh, I have almost my own little advisory network, right, who can connect me with the right people. And because of the Sarept experience and, you know, the, um, uh, you know, my branding as, you know, kind of patient supporting CEO, I had a lot of, uh, you know, parents who are trying to save their child of a new you know genetic mutation or rare disease we have partnered with a lot of these families as part of zontogeny and you know helping them find their path forward so uh, i've really benefited and feel like i have a good pulse um and yeah having said that we um we always acknowledge that there's an unmet need there for a lot of rare diseases that aren't the the big marquee you know yeah. like you know, SMA, Duchenne, ALS, right? I mean, we have so many companies going after those because there's regulatory precedent and understanding of the endpoints. But I often say, I want to see a company be more bold and go after some of these diseases where we have no treatments and there's nothing in development, right? And so uh, I often uh, am not dissuaded. You know, you'll uh, rarely hear out of my mouth, 
oh, that's not enough patience to make it worthwhile, right? I mean, I remember when I was at Sarepta and someone said, well, gee, uh, uh, Francis Collins wants to use our technology to look at progeria, but there are only, you know, a dozen patients around the globe. I'm like, if Francis Collins wants to use our technology, we'll find a way to get this approved and make money. Yep. And we'll be on the cutting edge of, you know, uh, and, and now, you know, we've had an N of one approvals and that sort of thing. So I think you need that boldness and that willingness to be risk tolerant, to push the envelope, you know, uh, you know, and, and in an appropriate way, right? I, you know, uh, you know, with the FDA and, and, and be collaborative partners with them because you've got a lot of support from Congress, from the NIH to, to make these things happen. So yeah, we do uh, try to get, uh, keep our pulse on the patient community, but we, we honor them and respect them with the way we approach our diligence and the way we evaluate, you know, even low prevalent, you know, uh, diseases that, you know, every patient uh, is important to find a path forward with. And so we, we, we try to invoke that in spirit and everything we do. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Chris, it, we have a number of outstanding questions, and I know uh, my clock says eight till. So, um, on a somewhat of a lightning round of questions, yep, I'm going to sure. attendee questions here. Um, so, one is um, what was the biggest surprise going from consulting strategy into actual leadership of a company? Um, well, I, I'd like to have always thought of myself as a, a servant leader. I've worked for some of the best CEOs the industry seen, you know, uh, and management teams, you know, at Gilead, it was John Martin and Norbert Bischoffberger and John Milligan, you know, at Celgene, I had the benefit of working for Saul Bearer and Bob Hugan and Dave Griska was the CFO at the time. And so I really have always said, look, who am I to say they don't know what they're doing? I'm going to serve them as best I can. And when you become a CEO, you have a different responsibility, right? You're serving the board, you're serving investors, you're serving the patients, first and foremost, right? And so my um, North Star was, I need to do everything I can for patients to get this drug approved and apply my learnings the best I can. And that should satisfy my board and my investors, right? Who are fiduciaries to the investors. Uh, so that has always been my guidepost. But what changes is you're responsible now. You're responsible not only to those other audiences that I just named, but to your employees, right? So I think the people management, right? Uh, you're, you're largely the architect of culture, the policies you put in, right? What kind of HR policy are you going to implement, right? You're going to allow, uh, you know, uh, paternity benefits for, you know, uh, uh, new fathers to take off and all like these things create culture. And so I've always tried to uh, hire those who love to work, who will work hard and get it done. But I've also never been one to say, how come you weren't here at you know, 8 a.m. this morning or you know, watching everybody and how, many, how much FaceTime they're putting in, no pun intended, with the, the world we're in now. And, uh, and have always tried to say, let's give people the benefit of the doubt. Let's not, you know, uh, if they're sick, let them take off, right? We can judge them on their performance and let's try to make it as easy for them to live their lives, to support their families, to you know, um, pursue their hobbies and pursuits as best they can. Uh, and, and, you know, part of that is hiring people who like to work, who are passionate, you know, about their accomplishments, and you can have it both ways. So I think for me, it was always um, dealing with it. Now, look, the, the, the challenge with that is not everybody's the same, and not everybody agrees with certain cultural things, and not everybody has the same work style. So what you find when you are a CEO, especially of an emerging and a larger company, is that you spend more and more time managing things, as I mentioned earlier, that are not on driving good drug development, right? It's managing HR issues and people and financing and going to conferences and talking to media and, you know, somebody posts something on Twitter and all of a sudden you've got a crisis that morning because somebody put out false information, you know, like, I have to be honest, I don't miss that stuff, right? <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> the, the putting out the fire of the day. Uh, you have yeah, different exactly. types of fires, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, They're a little more private, yep. Yeah, Here, here's another good one. Um, it says, because of the current situation forcing companies to move towards virtual business model in the coronavirus times, do you think more companies will opt for this model in order to have a broader reach of talent, or do you think this will show it, that virtual companies don't really work? No, well, so, you know, one of the reasons I started Zontogeny and uh, 
wanted to have an efficient, what I describe as middle market investing model was one conclusion, right, uh, that I drew was um, nothing uh, beats a clinical proof of concept data set, right? Uh, that has always, in 40 years of biotech, has always created value. If you have a good, well-designed study in patients and you have a positive data set, that, is, that has always been the goal, okay? And what I was recognizing was until you get to that point, right, there's a lot of wasted capital building big teams, right, uh, you know, building infrastructure, maybe uh, trying to boil the ocean with your technology and going after 10 programs at once. And I always felt that the goal needs to take that technology and first prove it, right, with well designed preclinical proof of concept studies with the goal of a good clinical proof of concept study, right, and data set. And I always felt that you could do that more efficiently. The second part of that is there hasn't been a, a, an abundance of talent that has a track record of success and a history of doing that well, right? And so I think the idea is if I could do that and efficiently apply a team with great experience and perceptive I add to that, you know, we have access to all their analysts who have a great track record of picking good technologies as well, that, that we would be successful. So uh, look, you know, check back in five years, you know, uh, 10 years and we can count how many of our programs <laughs> led to positive clinical data, but that has been the mission. And if we do that, the, 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 the last component is it, it respects and honors the entrepreneur and first time CEO and founders, early equity holders, because if we do that well, then, then they hold more equity and they do much better with their idea and their technology by partnering with us. And that has been the goal. And by the way, I don't know how to be a great venture capitalist. I know how to do good drug development. So I found a way to uh, create a venture strategy where I could rely on my strengths, right? Rather than just duplicate uh, a lot of firms that you know, have done very well as VCs and making money, uh, I decide I'm going to focus on what I do well, which I, I believe is, is drug development. Yeah. Well, listen, as somebody who's gone through that, that process personally once, you know, there's, we can check back in five years for the financial returns, but, you know, speaking on behalf of New York, I think one of the things that's going to be really valuable is, you know, I hope to look back in five years and see you know, a number of people that have, you know, learned a lot from you, uh, that have gone through a good process, that know what to understand uh, out of a startup company and, you know, are better than they were before. You know, I hope the financial returns are there too. But I think especially when people are starting, having the experience with, you know, someone that is genuinely on their side and someone that can show them the ropes that they haven't seen before, I think that's really valuable. I think from an ecosystem perspective, I think from a regional perspective, because those people can then go and share best practices with other people that are looking to raise capital. So uh, ideally, I'd like five more of you. Uh, that would be great <laughs> if you guys can, can get on that. That'd be wonderful. Um, but, you know, we really appreciate your, your dedication to New York and, you know, kind of can't thank you enough for, for coming on this morning. This is wonderful. So if you have any kind of parting shots for the audience, uh, you know, have, have at it. And thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, no, I, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you know, I encourage any entrepreneurs uh, or, or somebody thinking about a company, reach out to us. It's uh, www.zontogeny.com. I can be reached at chris at zontogeny.com. Uh, and you can talk to any of the CEOs we work with to know what we're about and how much value we bring. But Derek and Jennifer, real pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'm, you know, continue to be a champion of New York uh, a bio and the whole ecosystem there. So thanks for the opportunity. Great. Oh, thanks, Chris. We appreciate it. And right. stay tuned to everybody that, that's here. We'll have, uh, we'll be posting links and topics from the conversation on both our LinkedIn and our Twitter feed. Uh, we're going to keep things rolling with this breakfast series. Next, next up, we have uh, Ethan Weiss, who's a scientist and a cardiologist from UC San Francisco, who's going to join us bright and early in the morning. He's just finished uh, a stint at a major medical center in New York City on the front lines of COVID. That's going to be next week. Uh, and the week after that, we'll have uh, some alumni from the eLab program in New York City 
uh, that has done incredibly well. So, you know, hopefully we can keep raising the bar on the types of guests that we get. Thank you once again for joining us. Great. Thanks. Bye, everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.